from graphic novels and about their use in education. So graphic narrative is one of our oldest forms of communication. So think back to like cave paintings. This 20,000 year old depiction of a hunting excursion is a good example. It's a way of telling a story and that's exactly what visual narrative is all about. So our quick history of graphic novels starts a little bit later than Cro-Magnon days, but it's all still related. For thousands of years, most people were what we would now call illiterate. Reading was reserved for the wealthy, and drawings and cartoons were used to communicate with the working class. However, that all began to change with the start of the industrial era. The use of machines increased leisure time when people would seek entertainment, and around that time we saw an uptick in storytelling for the masses. That appeared through weekly periodicals, many of which were joke books or humor publications. Historically, humor has been used to address social ills or political agendas, and that's where we find our start, as well as the root for the term comics. So Benjamin Franklin's 1732 Poor Richard's Almanac used satirical cartoons to advance the cause of the American Revolution, and he later contributed the first political cartoon published in a newspaper, which is pictured above, in 1754. The next step came in the form of early paperback novels called dime novel magazines. Here we see a jump from satire and politics to stories usually illustrated with a sens sensationalized adventure or mystery, often in the American Wild West, so think like Davy Crockett and Buffalo Bill. Here we see a couple panels from The Adventures of Obadiah Old Buck. It was a serial in a weekly humor magazine called Brother Jonathan, and it told stories about the adventures of a young man and his lady love using captioned cartoons in a strip-like fashion. And that brings me to our first important vocabulary word here, which is sequential art. Sequential art refers to visual storytelling in which the panels represent a progression through a linear narrative. So here we understand these panels as happening in order from left to right. First, the artist is drawing and says, damn. We infer that he's made a mistake. Next panel, he thinks control Z, the keyboard command for undo. In the third panel, he says, damn, again, expressing frustration. And finally, in the last panel, he mutters that pens need an undo function. These events happen in a particular order and reading them in order from left to right matters to our interpretation of the story. So sequential art is a term we can use to talk about comics or graphic novels. In the late 19th century, sequential art started appearing in newspapers instead of just in humor magazines. So above is the Yellow Kid. It was the first sex successfully merchandised comic strip character, and it really increased newspaper sales. The Hearst Syndicate, which was a newspaper publishing group, realized that the um, comic uh, was very successful, and they released the first collected, collected edition of Yellow Kid cartoons in book form in 1897. It was essentially the first financially successful graphic novel, which is a term that we can use broadly to apply to any long-form sequential art. Sequential art really took off after that. Sears and Roebuck began using Buster Brown as a promotional comic in 1903, which made it the first nationally distributed comic book, even though it really was just an advertisement. And that connection with sales and consumerism is going to matter um, over the future history of comics and graphic novels. So once sequential art became popular, soft cover album collections began appearing from like 1959 through the mid 1930s, and they were just books containing all the comics from a particular series. Then we saw a shift to pulp magazine novels, which were named for the cheap pulp paper they were printed on. These were adventures that were aimed for men, so war stories, westerns, sci-fi, you can see that they are very explicit about them being aimed for men in the images above. These often ended up becoming radio series, and they were full of illustrations. Pulp magazines um, eventually gave way to reprints of newspaper strips, like the New Funnies, um, and they had a huge breakthrough in the form of Action Comics No. 1, which you might know better as Superman. It came out in 1938. So that really kicked off the golden age of comics. They became hugely popular in the early 1940s, and they mainly featured superheroes, cowboys, and detectives. They were still mainly marketed to men and boys, and they were especially popular with World War II soldiers because they were so lightweight and portable. However, backlash began in the 1950s with the introduction of television. It marked a huge shift in popular culture and induced a kind of moral panic. So educators complained that comics were a bad influence on reading abilities and literary taste. 
They worried that kids who read comics and watched TV would be less inclined to read traditional prose novels and that they would lose interest in classic stories. Churches and civic groups objected to immoral content, like the scantily clad women in jungle comics and the glorification of villains in crime comics. Mental health experts also joined the argument, especially Dr. Frederick Wortham. He was a psychiatrist who wanted to ban the sale of comics to children. He argued that they imitate the actions of comic book characters and become desensitized to violence. He was also concerned about representations of masculinity. He called Wonder Woman anti-masculine and a morbid ideal for girls. He also worried about Robin's genitals and bare legs, as in the quotation above. Robin is a handsome, ephibic boy, usually shown in his uniform with bare legs. He is buoyant with energy and devoted to nothing on Earth or in interplanetary space as much as to Bruce Wayne. He often stands with his legs spread, the genital region discreetly evident. Wardham spoke at legislative meetings and appeared in the media to try to outlaw comic sales to kids. However, he failed, and instead he wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent in 1954. In response to the panic, comic book publishers formed the Comics Magazine Association of America as a way to try to avoid government interference and legislation. So as a group, they created the Comics Code Authority, which was a series of regulations that would only put a seal of approval on a comic if it met a series of requirements. The requirements they initially agreed upon were no sex, violence, or other unsavory content, and that included a ban on the words terror or horror in the title. They had to emphasize respect for government and parental authority. They couldn't contain any slang or colloquialisms, and that was an answer to concerns about literacy, literacy skills. And finally, and most subjectively, they must be suitable even for the youngest readers. So that's a direct appeal to the belief in childhood innocence that we've talked about before. Comic shops were the enforcers for the Comics Code Authority. They wouldn't stock a comic unless it had a seal of approval. And this was the moment when comics became children's literature, which is, as we've discussed, a genre created by adults for what they believe childhood should be. Now, that's not to say that comics were under those restrictions all over the world. Japan's manga and the comic industry in Belgium and France continued to develop as an intergenerational art form. And they largely provided the inspiration for the emergence of underground comics in the U.S. in the mid-1960s. Their creators were not part of the Comics Magazine Association of America, and they didn't bear the seal. However, there was a market for them, and comic shops started stocking them for adult customers. By the 1970s and 1980s, those publishers began bypassing comic shops entirely and selling directly to customers, which meant that it was time for the Comics Magazine Association of America to regroup a little bit. In 1971, Marvel requested permission from the Comics Magazine Association of America to publish a special issue series of Spider-Man with a story arc about drug abuse. Its request was denied, but the request did trigger a review. At that point, only four publishers remained members. Those were Archie, Marvel, Harvey, and DC. At the 1971 review, they agreed to relax the ban on crime, but they decided that horror and terror still couldn't be used in titles. They also added a section about how to handle depiction of drug use. Now, a quick note about creators. That's the term we use rather than author or illustrator when we're talking about Graphica. Creators used to work on a contract basis, and they had no ownership or control over their characters. All profits went to the publisher, and the creators were paid only for their work, not for royalties. So there was a big year in 1978 with some pushback against that system. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had created the first mass-market trade paperback graphic novel. Huge deal. It was called Silver Surfer, but they were paid only the standard comic creation rates. Marvel got all the profit on that. And Lee and Kirby really went to bat for other creators after that happened to them. And they put enough pressure on Marvel and other publishers that things began to change. After that, Sabre became the first graphic novel granting full copyright ownership and sales royalties to creators. And then Will Eisner's A Contract with God became the first creator-owned and published graphic novel. And finally, in the same year, all of this in 1978, ElfQuest became the first creator-owned series to receive mass-market distribution in mainstream bookstores, not in a comic shop. So that was really a watershed year, and it speaks to a major component of the history of comics and graphic novels that differs from other types of literature. 
Though in actuality, all literature is affected by consumerism, the market, and the publishing industry, that reality has been significantly more public for the comics industry. It's all contributed to a perception of comics as a product rather than as literature, and that's kept Graphica out of the serious literature camp for many, many years. So you might be wondering what happened to the Comics Code Authority. The rise of independent publishers led to a big push for revision because member publishers were losing the ability to compete and creators were feeling like the requirements were hindering their creative talents. So there was a big revision in 1989, but it was basically meaningless because comic stores no longer wanted to act as enforcers. They just wanted to stock the literature that their customers wanted. So in 2001, Marvel, who was the heaviest hitter in comics, withdrew completely. By 2011, only Archie and DC were still using the seal of approval, and they dropped it by 2012. So now, publishers self-regulate their content, and if there is any pushback, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund helps fight for First Amendment rights in court. So why did we spend so much time on comics? It matters because comics are closely related to graphic novels, and they have a shared history. The same concerns about content and literary value plague graphic novels and have made it difficult for them to make headway in education. So let's examine that in some greater depth. What barriers have there been to the use of Graphica in classrooms and how can it be used? Initially, educators and parents opposed the use of graphic novels and comics in schools for many of the same reasons that launched a moral panic in the 1950s. That stigma carried over, and there was a lot of fear that comic use would undermine the traditional literacy skills that they valued. Also, America has always struggled with a belief that popular culture and children's culture are in some way inferior. Any movement into that territory was seen as anti-educational and bad for moral development. Now, some of that has begun to change with new beliefs about childhood and about learning. Realizations that children learn best when they enjoy the material prompted a revisitation of sequential art, as did expanding definitions of literacy. Being literate is about more than being able to analyze great expectations. It's interpreting visual cues and learning how to follow and tell stories. Additionally, the graphic novel boom has meant that there is a visual story for nearly every topic. It's not just superheroes and cowboys anymore. So I'm closing with a few ideas about how to use graphic narratives in the classroom. You could invite students to tell a story without words, just focus on using body language and images to communicate. Try drawing emotions and actions. That asks us to tune into encoded messages and what we know about the world around us. You might even ask them to translate a scene from a traditional novel into a page or two of sequential art. Why bother with those kinds of assignments? Well, it all comes back to critical literacy. This is about practicing what we know about encoding and decoding and learning how to create and interpret narratives in the world around us. Graphic novels have been a long time coming, but they have so much to offer.